From Eyewitness News, this is Newsmakers. Once the bread and butter of organized crime, sports betting could soon be legal in most states, thanks to a major U.S. Supreme Court decision last Monday. What it could mean for Rhode Island and for Twin Rivers, two state-licensed casinos in Lincoln and Tiverton. Our guest this week on Newsmakers, Twin River Chairman John Taylor. Welcome to Newsmakers. I'm Tim White. Joining me on the program from WPRI.com reporter Ted Nisi, chairman of Twin River John Taylor. It's good to have you back on the program. Thanks for having me. You have a few things going on, and I do want to start with that U.S. Supreme Court decision lifting the federal ban on sports betting. When you heard it, what was your reaction? I, I was, to be honest, I was surprised. I, I had expected a more nuanced opinion. Uh, where I, th I thought they were going to do something, but I didn't think they would repeal it in its entirety. Uh, so I was I was one of the few people who was uh, a little more surprised. I think many in the industry, uh, particularly those who were in the room when they heard the case, said, "Boy, this is a this is a slam dunk." Uh, but but you know, an outright repeal of PASPA was a surprise to me. That was the law that had banned sports betting, right? Which you know, back in 1992, the leagues uh, you know got aggressive uh, in Congress. I was actually. Uh, at the time working at GTEC and, and uh, we had a number of lotteries who were considering sports wagering at the time, uh, including Oregon, which got the carve out in Delaware, which also got the carve out. Uh, and we were we were on the other side of that issue. So it's, it's been a long time, 1992 to now, uh, that it's taken to uh, undo it. Can you boil down, John, for people watching? There are people who aren't gamblers, don't know sports betting. They've probably seen this get a lot of attention. Why is this such a big deal for, for your industry as well as the states that hope to tap into the revenue? So I think from, from my perspective and from Twin Rivers' perspective, what it's going to do is, is going to bring yet another demographic to our property that doesn't currently come. So if you were to look at uh, what we were five years ago, uh, we were predominantly uh, a slot parlor, and the, dem the average demographic uh, at that time was probably a late 50s leaned uh, female. Uh, fast forward, we got table games, and uh, what came with table games was kind of a late 40s, early 50s male, and a lot of energy. So if you walked around the floor you know, eight years ago, the energy level is much different than the floor looks now. And what, what sports betting what sports betting does is 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 bring uh, a little bit younger. So I think the average sports better in uh, Nevada right now is uh, late 30s, early 40s. Uh, but in some surveys that I've seen, you know, um, you know, males from 21 to 44 are interested in it. So I think from our perspective, consistently we've said the floor is not going to look the way it looks today in five years, and I said that five years ago, and it clearly doesn't. Uh, and this is one of those pro products that I think pushes us uh, to where the future is. Um, so we're we're looking we're looking forward to it. There's lots of open issues that need to be resolved in a relatively short basis. Have you talked to state leaders since the decision came down? So yes, we uh, we have. They're in the middle of a, they're in the middle of an RFP uh, to solicit. Uh, the technology and the bookmaker. Uh, so they. Because they that's something people should understand. You're not going to Twin River decide like the point spread for the Patriots. No, if this no, we're we're not, and nor do we want to. We have other we have other properties in other states where sports betting is either legal today or will be soon, and and we've we've said uh, internally that that's not what we're about. Why so, not use the line out of Vegas? Um, First of all, the Wire Act is probably the biggest reason. You <laughs> okay. can't, so there's a legal uh, there's barrier. A le there's a okay. legal barrier uh, to do that. Big casino companies tend to make their own book. Uh, Mid-size tend not to. They tend to go with an expert who has a lot of experience and a lot of data that can help them uh, with those lines. So in, in Rhode Island and in Mississippi, uh, we will not. Uh, will not be our own bookmaker. We'll work with, it's in Rhode Island, the state will provide those services. In Mississippi, we will work with the third I mean, party. Like the state will, like, Gina Raimondo is not going to look and like, I think the Jets are weak. We're gonna, <laughs> it's going to be, they're going to hire a company that the state that, will hire and, a and company. And that's, that's the process, that's the process that they're in right now. There's And there's a lot of learning that's going on uh, right now as part of that, as part of that process in terms of what makes a successful 
sports betting program. Lobbyists from the uh, professional sports leagues, they want to put, a, I think, a quarter percent, I think they said, on all bets. Um, do you support or oppose that? So it started, it started as 1% of handle which in a 5% whole game equates to 20% mm. of, of the revenue, okay. which, which was very, very high. And we can talk about what makes a successful sports betting product. Um, our position is that we support that of the American Gaming Association, who's done a lot of thinking about this, uh, and they're opposed, they're, they're opposed to that. You should know, they get any a, cut? From a, legislated per, from a legislative perspective, should there be fees legislated uh, the answer is no. Are there things that they can provide commercially which will add to the experience that the player has? And, and should those kind of arrangements be, you know, considered? Yes, they should, but they're more commercial agreements rather than legislative. Not agreements. tied to the bet, then. Not, not tied to, you know, a, a right by law to get a certain amount of money. At the end of the day, depending on who you listen to, there's somewhere between 150 and $400 billion of illegal wagering going on in the United States right now. So the leagues, from an integrity perspective, are very, very focused on those issues already. So the incremental cost of having a legitimized sports betting system in, in the United States just aren't, you know, just aren't there. And the other thing, that the, the most important thing, is anytime you add something to the equation where the odds begin to get distorted. So if you added a 20% of gross gaming revenue fee into the middle of this, into the middle of this program, you know, the better looks, at, it's going to be reflected in the odds and the, and the better is going to look at it and say, my odds are better back online where I'm embedding illegally, or maybe they're better in Massachusetts or Connecticut, or maybe they're better, you know, at the local bar where I've been, you know, placing my bets. Interesting. Um, can you paint a picture for us how you, you know, presuming the legislation goes through and all the state leaders support it, so it's, it seems like a done deal, though there's details, as you said, to be worked out. You know, if they say, all right, John, you know, get sports betting up and running, is it going to be a room? Are you going to have apps right. when you're walking around Twitter? Like, how will people actually bet on sports? So we're, we're in the, um, we've, been, we've been at it now for a little, a little while in terms of considering uh, what we what we'd want to do if it came to fruition, uh, the conventional wisdom for you know those of you that have been to Las Vegas is there's a big room with a thousand TV screens and a bunch they call them carols the little tables and chairs with kind of three walls around it with a TV in the middle of it and you sit there and you take your your materials out and you figure out who you're going to bet on. That's not what we're thinking about. What 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 we're seeing now and it may go to who is really. Uh, the sports better today is more social environments. So sports bar environments with couches and, and mini environments where groups of people can get together and and, and watch a game that's uh, that's there. So Less still, formal. It still, sounds like still lots of still lots of televisions, uh, but a much more social environment with you know food and beverage and and you know places where people can wander around and. You know, do their thing. And do you think it's uh, doable for October first? The state has said they want October first to launch. Do you think that's doable? So there's a lot of you know there's a lot of variables that that are still being worked on. The, the biggest is is who's going to provide the technology and uh, the bookmaking services. So uh, in terms of us, you know, could we be ready with a social environment that could house this kind of equipment by in, in this kind of product by October first? I think we can. You know, we've identified uh, we've identified where we would put it. We've identified where how we would expand it. We identified how it kind of fits into this, you know, millennial player that we're trying to attract over time. So we we put a lot of thought into, you know, where and how. So could something be up and running? Uh, by October 1st, from our perspective, the answer is yes. What cut would the state get from sports betting? betting? Would it be, you know, 61% like they do from VLTs, 18% like they do from table games, or something else? I, I think all that's to be determined, and, and a lot of that uh, is, is being kind of worked on now. The, the uh, state will get back their uh, bids on, uh, from the, in reaction to their RFP this past Friday. Um, and, uh, and based on that, I, I think they'll begin to see how the market looks at these kind of programs. And again, how to make a successful, how to make a successful uh, program. Um, because uh, 
it, it all comes down to the odds because those players are going to know that you know I can get better or better odds there or there. They're so gonna, the the cut the state gets could affect the odds. Uh, by by definition, yes. If it's a five percent hold game, you know the what whatever comes out of that will affect the odds that the bookmaker can offer. So they may have to offer um, you know worse odds to kind of accommodate things like integrity fees, uh, you know, if and when they were if and when they were legislated. So again, I think there's a lot of moving pieces. I think the state's doing a lot of uh, deliberate work right now. I think there's a lot of work that will get done for them in response to their RFP, and we're doing a lot of work in terms of the kind of environment that we want to create for these players uh, to, to try to put together the Well, do you think a different way to ask the money question then, does the state uh, in the budget is banking on $23.5 million for the state to come in, uh, their share, in the next fiscal year. Do you think that's a reasonable amount based on what you've yeah. seen of what you could generate? And I have not, uh, you know, I have not looked at their projection, where they got their projection uh, or or the assumptions that underpin the, their, uh, their projections. So I'm not going to comment specifically on that, but I, I do think that uh, the various stakeholders uh, will eventually kind of come together and, and have a discussion about how to how to maximize the program uh, from 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 the player's perspective as well as the state's perspective. What about um, online betting? This is sort of a related but different piece of this that's coming up in the same conversation. Um, is, is that something Twin River wants to do? And, and do you think you need to go back to voters if we want to start doing online betting in Rhode Island? So from a, from a mobile perspective, uh, we one of the things we said that we wanted to make sure was possible is that our players could walk into our facility and use their phone to, to wager on sports, right? So within the four walls of our facility, uh, we, we thought that was an amenity that would be very useful and helpful. Uh, and, I, and I think as part of the state's RFP, they considered that. Beyond that uh, is, a, is a different question, and it has to do with the Rhode Island Constitution and, uh, and whether going beyond the four walls of our facility uh, is, is doable or not. And well, according to a legal memo from DraftKings, they say, uh, they argue, if the mobile um, betting or online betting is funneled through the licensed casinos, so Twin River, then they don't need to go to voters uh, yeah. with that. Do you agree or disagree? That's clearly an argument that people make that where the servers are is where the gaming happens. Um, right. And, and yeah, like if the computer's in your basement, basically, doesn't matter where you're Not John is. Taylor's basement, but Twin <laughs> River's yeah. basement. Or, or, or in Tiverton. Yeah. I, I'm not sure that I personally read the law the same way. Interesting. Um, Do you, the state's talking about, about getting you know, a... I, I, I have not seen their opinion, and I have not seen their arguments. So preliminarily, I don't see it, not to, not to, not to mean that. Um, there's not uh, there's not a way. State's talking about getting us maybe ask, Senate President Ruggiero, I should say, has talked about getting a, a state Supreme Court uh, advisory opinion on what is the law there about online. Do you think that's the right course to take? That's you know that's something that's happened in the past, right? There's Casino One and Casino Two advisory opinions from the state Supreme Court that really guides how we uh, manage our business uh, in Lincoln. Uh, that's that's certainly uh, that's certainly a path. That could be that could be considered. All right. Why don't we take a break on the program? When we come back, we're going to get an update on where things stand on Twin uh, River in Tiverton. Our guest this week is Chairman of Twin River, John Taylor. Stay with us. You're watching Newsmakers. Welcome back to Newsmakers. I'm Tim White. To my left, WPRI.com reporter Ted Nisi. Our guest this week is chairman of Twin River, John Taylor. John, uh, one reaction I've gotten about the potential legalization of sports betting uh, is it'll put illegal, uh, illegal bookies out of business. Having covered organized crime for way too many years, I disagree with that, actually, but that's a whole other conversation. Uh, but one thing I have learned in covering organized crime is if there is any money for, for them to make, they're going to try and do it. Um, and I'm wondering if there are, with all your preparations on how it'll look inside the casino and how people will place the bets, um, 
are, are there any preparations or precautions that Twin River is taking to address the concerns of a criminal element coming with, with sports betting? In terms of, um, you know, first of all, people shouldn't come to casinos if they're going to do something illegal because every square inch of that facility is covered with a camera, with a surveillance operator on the other side, and uh, when we do sports betting, it will be that case there as well. So you know, we're very, very focused, uh, and our regulators are very, very focused on uh, eliminating that kind of behavior. Um, you know, something we talked about a little earlier uh, for this program, it's, it's critical that the program be set up in a way where it can compete against uh, the black market as well as as well as our neighbors, but in terms of in terms of uh, you know the mafia or something you know coming in uh, booking bets at Twin River, um, that's not going to happen. Well, I, you know I've had a conversation with Colonel Ann Asumpico, the Rhode Island State Police, you know, under the context of staffing mm -hmm. State Police, and as Tiverton comes online, she'd like to see the Portsmouth barracks reopen uh, because that would be the closest barracks to Tiverton. But um, have you talked to the State Police yet? Uh, about uh, expanding into sports betting, and do you get a sense from them they're going to need to put more people in, I think in the Twin River? Th those conversations tend to happen between the Department of Business Re Regulation and the lottery um, rather than directly with us, although we're consulted in terms of what are you thinking and how is it going to work and what we should be thinking about. So our conversations uh, don't usually occur directly with the state police uh, unless we're asked. Although we have uh, we have a contingent in the gaming enforcement unit that's in on the property every right. single day. Yeah, you have to house and, them there. And we yeah. are engaged with them on the day in and day out uh, issues that sometimes crop up, and uh, you know certainly sports betting will just be an, another product that they're going to have to focus on. But in terms of staffing and those kinds of things. We haven't had those direct conversations at this point. Tim mentioned the new uh, Tiverton Casino. You, you experienced, I know, some delays on finishing that project uh, on the original timeline. When do you expect it to open now? So it's, it's shocking that a year ago, right now, there were trees on that site and we're going to start laying carpet in early June. So in terms of how quickly things have come along, uh, they, they have come along. When we were in the campaign uh, we had we had kind of set it up in a way that we were supposed to present uh, kind of zoning changes and comp plan changes, which would be subject to the voters. Uh, and the planning board there decided that they didn't want to do it that way. So so we got delayed in terms of the approvals process in town. So we wanted to front end load that so that the voters had you know kind of full information from a zoning and yeah, because you wanted to open this summer, if I remember right. We wanted to open you know during the campaign. We talked about July. That didn't happen. We didn't end up getting those approvals until uh, later in the second quarter of 2017, which slowed us down. And then we ran into some significant construction issues on the property, a lot of ledge there, a lot more than anyone thought was there. So the date started to slip. Um, and, and we've been you know, successful and very aggressively trying to pull uh, that date forward. Uh, technically right now, uh, the date is October 1st. Uh, I don't think it'll end up being there. Uh, I'm highly confident that it'll be earlier than that. Um, there's a couple of things before I make any public pronouncements, so I'm not going to make news on your show. It is uh, called Newsmakers, yeah, John, so we prefer if you did. <laughs> so, so I know the uh, state's looking for September 1st, I'm hearing. Right, and there are a couple of things that I want to be sure that get done. And I, I would think within the next week or so, we're going to have an announcement about a new date. Um, I've also heard that that could get you off the hook for the two million bucks the governor yeah, wanted you to right. pay her to help her balance the budget because of the delay. Is that where do those conversations stand? So those those conversations uh, have occurred, and a lot of the a lot of the time and resource and effort that we put into uh, pull, pull, pulling the date forward. Um, you know, have taken the place of a conversation about a direct payment. Mm. Um, obviously, opening earlier means you know more money uh, for the state of Rhode Island. I think, uh, I think incrementally over what Newport uh, generates today, it's a couple million dollars a month of incremental revenue that we're open in Tiverton. So, 
that's our focus. That's what we're doing. Uh, again, uh, I had hoped that I might be able to come today and say there's a new date, but but I think within the next week or so we should. I don't. I, I'm I'm not going to make any promises that I can't 100 percent keep, and and I'm almost there. But so. Uh, I, if I read it right, the price tag also nearly doubled, 75 million to 140 million. Sounds like you touched on one reason, the ledge you had to deal with. But w why did it go up so much? So, so certainly the site added a lot. The cost of materials added a lot. Uh, the cost of labor added a lot. As as construction projects began to pop up all over the place, uh, it started to it started to cost more money. The other thing is, uh, and not to be lost in all this, is you know, when you do something, you do it right. And, and that move from Newport to Tiverton was a, was a core element of our strategy to compete against Southeastern Massachusetts. And uh, right. so, you know, the fact that the price went to 140 is, is, is driven by some of those other things I talked about but as much about doing it right and making sure that we deliver an experience and So people, for under, those. people understand, when I talk about the price tag going up, that's Twin Rivers bill, that's yeah, not. Per, some they, people might think know, taxpayers are paying right, right, that. 100% no, percent, yeah. percent ours, we've never asked for or received any subsidies from governments on either the project that we have going on in Tiverton, which is $140 million, or the $30 million that we're spending in in Lincoln for a hotel there, which will open later this summer as well. Well, you mentioned it, so let's uh, let's go. We have a little time left to the Massachusetts question. Right. So you keep a close eye on what they're doing on casinos up there. Um, you mentioned Southeastern Mass, which is the the prime threat, but I want to put that to the side for one moment and first ask how big an impact do you think the Springfield and Everett casinos in Massachusetts, which are being built now and will be opening, uh, will have on Twin River? So, way back when, when they first cited those facilities. Uh, we did our we did our study of what we thought the impact could be. Uh, State did their study of what the impact could be. Um, that study, all in for Massachusetts, said 30 to 35 percent. Um, the first uh, the first element of that was Plain Ridge, mm -hmm. uh, and in our models, we thought Plain Ridge was going to be a, an impact of about 12 to 12 and a half percent. Uh, in the first year, it was just under five, and then we had another one point down in the second year. So you've uh, done far better against Plain so Ridge than far you better. And, and, you Why know, do you think I'll that say, is? I'll, I'll say this about I'll say this about competition and what's coming. You know, w when 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 the new owners got involved in November of 2010, we made a conscious decision that we were going to be a convenience casino, and we were going to be a place where it was going to be easy to go, to get into, and to get out of. And based on the location in Lincoln and what we have now coming in Tiverton, it is, right? It is very simple to get off 146 and get into that property from a lot of different places, including, you know, Quincy and Braintree. And uh, the other thing we said is we need a, we need a broader product offering, right? To, to succeed, we need to differentiate ourselves. And we went out and we got table games and we're going to implement stadium gaming this summer. And now we're going to have sports betting. So, 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 you know, we tried to create an environment where people had lots of things to do poker. We never thought we were gonna have a poker room, very successful poker room, maybe the most profitable or successful poker room on the East Coast right now. Careful, the state will take more of your revenue. <laughs> <laughs> it's a rake game. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but so, so I think, you know, we, we've stuck to our knitting and, and you know, differentiation, convenience, customer service, those are kind of the bread and butter. I wanted to, I, before team. we get to the end, I want to ask, though, about what you make of what's going on in Southeast Mass. We have legal questions about whether the tribe even has the right that's trying to build a casino. What do you make of what's going it's on a over very, there? It's a very complicated calculus of, of what's happening there, and it kind of gets wrapped up in Indian gaming law, uh, and now Congress has uh, gotten involved in that. Um, you've heard me say this before, you know, we like to focus on the things that we can focus on. Our reaction to the Southeast was clearly, let's try to get the voters in Tiverton and statewide to allow us to take that license and put it in Tiverton. That's what we're doing. Okay. Is it fair to say any, every delay is a benefit to Twin River though in Southeast Mass, more time to establish your casino and I, get people and, going and there? And establish your players and your relationship with your players. Players tend to be loyal if you give them a reason to be loyal and we think we do a good job we try to do a good job at giving them those reasons. 
All right, we have about a minute left. Um, you have said a couple of times demographics uh, could get younger, should get younger with sports betting. You can still smoke inside Twin River in Lincoln. I assume that will be true in, in Tiverton in certain sections. Have you rethought that not knowing that, you know, younger people could be coming into the, uh, your casino? We've talked about it in the past. A, a lot of our players prefer to smoke. Um, in, in Lincoln, we're fortunate that we have a second floor, which is coincidentally the exact same size as Penn National or Plain Ridge, uh, which is completely non-smoking and it has a full complement of the products uh, of the products that we offer, uh, and we will have a separate section in Tiverton that allows for that as well. So it sounds like no, and no, we have I, 15 but, seconds I, left. But but we've always listened to our customers, right? We never thought we needed a hotel in Lincoln, and what we heard from our table game players is we'd like an amenity hotel. So we're always going to listen. Chairman John Taylor from Twin River, thank you so much for joining us. For Ted Nisi, I'm Tim White. We'll see you next week on Newsmakers. See, we had so much to talk about. That's what